because the management and transparency is what's very important. So once you submit a referral, you're going to have your own home advantage account and it's going to tell you where everything sits. So if you have 10 referrals that you've sent into the network, it's going to give you all 10 referrals. It's going to tell you every milestone that that client is sitting in, whether they're touring homes, whether they're in escrow. And you now can manage through the Home Advantage application as far as what your pipeline looks like for the referrals that you've sent. And so it's pretty sophisticated uh, and it's, it's all click of a button, guys. So there's a lot of conversations about the word influence nowadays. What does that mean? How can you use influence? Is it the most important aspect of your business going forward? There's so many ways that we can take the word influence. And by as luck would have it, we have the expert that many of you may already know in the real estate world. Rene Rodriguez, who is the author of Amplify Your Influence. He's got a podcast called Amplify. He speaks damn near 365 days a year. I'll, I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly, but 237 is a pretty good number. Countless podcasts, teaching professionals how to articulate better, how to grow their influence, how to speak, how to grow their brand. And he uses his expertise in the field of neuroscience, body language, all these things that we are going to share with you today. I'm excited. Selfishly, I don't care, Renee, if one person doesn't listen to this podcast because I know I'm going to get something out of it. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, my friend. That's uh, that's the best kind of podcast to have, one that we can just have some fun. That's right. That's right. So, And, and I'm going to tell the audience, so I am guilty, Renee, of, of asking my guests often Tell me a little bit about yourself. I just think it's interesting to hear backstories, but you already told me, don't ask that question because <laughs> you can go read about it in my book. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's one of those that, and maybe I'm just sick of saying it, but I, what I've come is the, the best podcasts are the ones that just dive into a question and they go right into it. it like we've got to hook people the same way we hook, the, hook people in social media. We got to hook them in a podcast and maybe that's our first nugget is how do we we capture attention in a highly distracted world like if you're still listening right now good for you man like you've got a lot going on you've got so much happening right now you've got clients to serve you've got competitors going after your business you've got the government saying and not helping the media not helping and you're listening to us so that's a that's an honor and so to me i go let's give them meat let's give them value let's give them tactics uh let's give them new ways of thinking let's let's uh like I said, you know, the more selfish the host is, the better. Love it. Perfect. Then we are going to skip that portion of this. And, and I will say this, you know, as, as it relates to podcast versus social, and we're going to, I think we're going to talk about this today. You know, I think mm -hmm. in, when it comes to a podcast, someone gets in, they, they push play with the intent of listening for a period of time. Whereas on right. a social post, you literally have a fraction of seconds to grab their attention. And, and so let's, let's start right there. I mean, let's talk about, uh, you know, as we're talking to a real estate world, which is also, I think, a, a large portion of your audience, you know, we are all talking about how we need to grow our business by showing up consistently, shooting more video. And, and that's fairly vague. So where should someone start if this is where they want to go? So I love that you said that, that it's vague. The advice is vague. So let's say I'm a realtor and somebody, you keep hearing, just create content, create content. That's content. And I hear content, 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 short form, long form, content, content. And I'm, I'm going, what the hell is content? Well, cont content's an output that, that lands on, on some sort of platform, typically in social media. So then it's not just about content. It's what kind of content? Well, what am I going to say? Is that interesting? I mean, all these questions, like, do I hit play? Do I talk to the camera? Do, do I, when do I hit record? What am I trying to do? And then you get into the formulas and because there are formulas that work, trust me, 11 years of failure, finally to, cover, to, to discover one. And when we discovered it seven months ago or whatever it was, we went from, I started a new account in four months, we grew to 115,000 followers on Instagram and our on TikTok in seven months, we grew to 800,000. Like, wow. It should be this week, it hits 800,000. 
And <clears throat> so there's a formula to it, but man, where do I start? And so here's, here's what I would say. One, there's a skill set of creating content. There's a skill, understanding how cameras work, understanding how a microphone works, understanding the importance of lighting, the backdrop, right? You, if you, I don't know if we're doing video or not, but you can see I have a backdrop and I can change that backdrop and I can land in New York City or I can have flames in the background, right? Whatever it is we want, I like the blurry sky. And so the importance of the backdrop, you can see my, my, my book just blurred kind of out in the background. You can see a lighthouse, it becomes sort of a central message of things that we do, books that I like reading. There's your backdrop. So then there's the technology of it. Well, where do I put it? How do I edit a video? And it can, it can get really overwhelming really, really fast. And so the best thing we tell people, you know, in the beginning, use your phone, hit record and start talking. So, okay, there you go. That's a starting place. That's not the end. It's a starting place. And that's how you start getting comfortable with it. And just like walking, just like shooting a, you know, swinging a, a golf club, shooting a basketball, anything, you're not going to be good at first. That's a rule of life. You're not good at anything at first. And when we were kids, we gave ourselves so many chances to walk, but then now all of a sudden we're adults and we go, oh, we tried a couple of times. I'm not good at it. Go, hold on a second. Let's go back. <laughs> let's, let's, let's fail at something for a couple of years. It's worth it. But, you know, and the failure is, if you reframe it, is also part of the journey of success. There's no, you can't shortcut the failure. So let's fail a bunch to win a bunch. And so you got to hit record. You got to get on there. Then you got to feedback. You got to iterate. That sucked. That was good. Next one gets a little bit better. Sucks a little less. Gets a little bit better. Well, that one was a bomb. Laugh about it. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. Keep going. And then once you're starting to get comfortable, you watch, I mean, everybody, you watch my first videos. I could literally show you my first video because I just found it this morning, like when I was doing this. And, you know, like literally I can send you the screenshot of me sitting in front of an iPad thinking I was doing something. And my big technology sitting in front of the iPad was I had a remote to turn the, the camera on and off. And I had a whiteboard. Does it sound good here? Does it sound good there? Now that was four years ago. No, almost three years ago. Whatever. It was March, 2022, 2020, March, 2020. So three years ago. And now I'm sitting in a hundred thousand dollar studio that I have six different camera angles, six different studios in here. I've got another camera that's ready off here that's recording everything that I'm saying that will end up on social media in a long form. I've got you and I being recorded. I'm looking at you through a teleprompter. So that's the growth, but the only reason I grew that fast, now three years is still a long time. If I were to tell you, you start with something now, you'll suck for three years. Yeah. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to devote your, your time and energy to a craft to master it? Three, five, 10 years. Well, you, the 10 years are going to pass, three years are going to pass. The question is, will you be better at what you do or not? Yeah. So there's that mindset that's critical. And so then now you get into, okay, now I'm on there. I've understand the technology. I can figure out in the basic edits. What do I say? What do I say? Now that's, I think that's where you and I wanted to talk. I'll pause there, but I think that's might be the, the, the jump off point of, so now what do I say? Yeah. I want to ask some questions first. Uh, and I want to, I want to go back to you talking about your growth and you know the first thing that i would always <clears throat> question with anyone that is a successful individual and we talk about this in our social media teachings because we're usually talking to people that have no influence they have very few followers and so a lot of the conversation becomes listen don't be paralyzed by virality because that's mainly vanity for most focus on you know, what the end result is here, which is not to become Jake Paul, right? Or some yeah. massive influence, the Kardashians. So you mentioned your rapid growth on social. And so my question to you would be, is you guys figured out a recipe, but as you're talking to an audience full of probably a vast variety of, of professionals, probably many of which have less than, let's just use Instagram or TikTok, less than 500 followers on both, right? Maybe even combined, you know, do you ever, how, how, I guess, how would you answer the question is to, okay, Renee, you grew there because you have a team, you have a hundred thousand dollar studio, you have practiced, you're articulate. There's no way in hell I can recreate that. There's no way in hell I'm going to get to that level. What would you yeah. say to that person that, that already is quitting before <laughs> they even want to continue on? chicken and the egg, right? Am I, do, 
do I have am I, do I have the success on there because of the studio or do I have the studio because of the success of my willingness to do that? Right. And so which, which one begins first? Well, one, I sucked at this for years. Go back to my old social. I didn't, I didn't understand how to deliver and create content. I didn't understand how to, and I still, there's pieces of my social media that I, I'm not good at. I'm not good at getting on and doing stories and um, sharing of myself. I'm not good at holding the camera up and talking to just cause I, 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 what do you want me to say? I'm still struggling with that sort of mental challenge of, you know, hey, hey, like walking, hey guys, walking to the grocery store and I was watching somebody do this video. Hey, you know, when you're old, when you have to, you sit there in the, the vitamin aisle for, for, for 45 minutes reading labels. And I was like, that's so funny. And I'm like, I do that all the time. Why don't I say that? You know, and I'm, and so there's a self-doubt that's, that's never going to go away. My first studio was my webcam and I would literally be, because I didn't have the, the bandwidth to do it. And I, I was going on Wi-Fi and I was, I mean, everything was wrong. And so in the beginning, everything was wrong. And the only reason I have the studio is because I went through the failure. And I realized that this was one, this is something I have to do. You don't need a hundred thousand dollar studio. I just do this for a living. And so this was, you know, I don't have a, a, an office space. I have my house. So I get to invest in my, my home office the same way you guys invest in, in you know, a, a place that you go um, there. So it's not that I'm special in any way, shape or form. I'm just stubborn and I keep going after it. And so, yes, do I speak for a living? Yes. Is that an advantage? hundred percent. But I only speak for a living because I sucked at it for so many years. I've been doing this 30 years. And I guarantee you, most of my years were to empty rooms and empty audiences. Yeah. So you have to be able to love what you're doing and love it so much that you'll do it to the empty room. You also mentioned, you know, you've got to spend three years doing this. And when we, when you say doing it for three years, I, I sometimes think maybe some people are thinking to themselves, okay, I just, time just needs to pass. But the reality is within that three years, it's, you know, it, Michael Jordan didn't make so many shots because he wasn't neurotically in the gym. Michael Phelps doesn't swim so fast because then he wasn't neurotically in the pool you know, it, you've got to actually press play often, maybe daily and practice this, right. And learn from those mistakes. But you also mentioned, and I think you articulated it differently on, on almost, and I, this is the way I, I took it, studying yourself. You need to, you need to record the videos, but then watch yourself to learn from yourself. And you've probably heard this from people before, especially real estate agents who say, if I watch what I just recorded, I'll never post it. I just got to post it. But I remind them all the time, you're never going to get better if you don't actually take the time to try to improve. What would you say to talking about learning from mistakes, but also the importance of that consistency over those, the three years, yeah. you're just using three years blindly, obviously, as a, as a number. You're, you're very insightful. I love what you're saying there because what you're, you're saying a few things. One, there's a balance of perfectionism versus execution right? So you got to respect the person that says I post, I post without looking because otherwise I'll stop myself. That's beautiful. I love that. Phase one, post without critique. You got to get past the, it, the critique is okay. You get past the shame and the over-perfectionism of what's going on. And so if you're that person that says I post without looking in the beginning, I think that's okay because you're getting content out there. Will you grow from that? To your point, no, because you're not reviewing the tape. You're not reviewing what you did. You don't see the mistakes and the ums and the ahs and the quirks and the and the, the idiosyncrasies that might be throwing off your message, the opportunities for you to tighten up the, the message or what really worked. Man, that was a really good phrase. What was that? I want to say that again. Or man, why did I say that? Why do I keep stumbling over that word? Do I really say across or across? You know, there's people have all sorts of, you know, height, height. There's all sorts of weird, you know, word things that, that people end up falling into. They don't, if they don't watch the tape, they're not going to grow. So think about it from a phased perspective in the beginning, get it out there, then start growing, make up in numbers, make up in quantity, which you lack in skill. And once you start getting it out there, move into the quality perspective and get better at what you're saying. So I think it's, it's a balance. It's a both and not an either, or it's not checking a box. Yes. Which I think a lot of people are, are just doing. Well, I, I look at social media as a department. That's, I had to kind of frame that. And I look at my desk as a set. It's a stage. And so when I kind of reframed my desk, then I designed my work around that so that I could be the, as my friend Brad Lee says, be the content. 
you don't have content days, just be it. That's why I have my, what I call my Brad cam right there. What's up, Bradley? I have this cam because he records that. And his whole thing was content days. And he was busy. He's like, man, I don't want to I mean, just meeting. And you know what? Hold on a second, man. I am the content. Just start recording. And he was coaching and recording. And all of a sudden that's became this concept. And it's brilliant because now I don't, there's no friction in, in recording content. I can just be in this authentic meeting here on a podcast for lab coat. And at the same time, creating content for them at the same time, con creating content for my audience on social media. And if you're recording, you're creating it for your audience on social media. So, I mean, it's, it's the, the ultimate multi-purposed repurposing of the single one act of conversing in an authentic conversation. I love that. And I also hate it. And here's why. I love it because you and Brad have a unique advantage. I could do the same thing. I don't because I'm really good at authentic content, which I guess I'm learning is, is a unique talent. I think as we're talking to the audience that's listening today, very few of them, if any, have the ability to do what you do. They're not in, they're not in, they're not in a position to where they're sitting on webinars all day, Zooms all day, podcasts all day. And so there is a creative muscle that is necessary for them to actually create content. So how would you, how would you get them over that hump? Well, they're in meetings. I mean, if you're not in meetings, then you got a sales problem, right? If you're not meeting and talking to clients or your team members or anyone, then, then you've got a sales issue. Then you're not generating enough business. And so then don't worry so much about social. <laughs> you know, I mean, you build a business and, and, and start creating meetings. But even if you're brand new, you're going to be talking to people. Record it. If you have ideas, talk to your buddies. Get on, get on and have a conversation with, with another colleague and just talk about ideas. What's happening? Talk about your struggles. Like, I'm new and this sucks, man. I called, it, I called somebody and, man, they didn't answer. Like, like that's real. And then if you're talking to your buddy, that, become, that becomes content as well. And so record the conversations. And then you got to then, the edit has to make sure that it's structured and framed in a way that adds value to the listener and the, and the, the observer and the, and the person that's, that's receiving the information. So there's always content to be recorded. There's always conversations. It might be with you and your child. Hey, what's going on? You have a bad day at school? That's content. But then turn it into a message at the end. Make sure that there's a value point. That's great. Uh, great response to that question. Uh, and I, and if, if I'm going to, I'm just going to tell you right now too, I, and I think our guests know this about me. I will always try to challenge my guests. Please. Um, I, I know you can handle it, but um, that's, that's part of where that question comes from. So I love the response, a, a wonderful response, which now leads me to the next challenge, which is, all right, I have no idea how to edit anything how in the hell? And and by the way, uh, the last year has been a struggle on my pocketbook. I can't afford yeah. to pay somebody to edit. So what would you say to that person before we still, before we even get to the, what do I say? Oh, uh, well, one, I feel you. Like if, if editing's painful, there's a great app called CapCut. Download on your phone. It makes editing really easy. It makes it really, 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 really easy. Um, Fiverr.com, find editors. There, there's editors that will do $25 videos. 25 bucks they'll do your video. I, they're not going to be the best, but it'll be a heck of a lot better than the ones you're not doing. And $25 editor will learn. Show them the styles that you like. If you like my style, go say, hey, look at Renee's video. If you like Brad Lee's, if you like Ed, Grant Cardone's, Ed Milet's, if you like whoever, go say, I like this style. I like Gary Vee's style. Pomozi style, whoever, go find those and say, I want it to look like this. Yeah. And start with one, two videos a week. That's 25 bucks, 50 bucks. Cook inside, stay inside, don't eat out one or two nights. Trade it for a video and start thinking about it from that perspective. And if you can teach yourself, I mean, there's, there's also AI, and I don't have it in front of me, but there's an AI out there that will clip up your videos yeah. and do it for you and add captions. I mean, I mean, if I know of one and it's somewhere in my phone, it's in my save to have a file under chat GPT, all the AI stuff, but there's ones that'll do it for you. So get creative, get innovative, get resourceful and go find those things. 
I think Git Munch might be one of the ones you're talking about. Cool. There's, and there's a ton of AI tools out there now that you're right. And it's removing the objection because now all of this stuff is essentially done for you. You're going to send me down a rabbit hole because I'm going to ask the question since you brought it up. So I am living in the world of AI and we're talking about it. We've been talking about it for about a year and a half now, well before we even really knew what AI was going to become. Now I'm actually going, you know, you, you go to these conferences and I know you do this as well. And, and we're, we're now hearing all of these speakers talking about all of these efficiencies and all of these, these hacks. I'm kind of looking at it from a different lens and saying, be careful. Don't get too lazy. Are the platforms going to catch up? Is the human is 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 the human going to catch up and realize what's created by a robot versus what is created by you? What is your take on that whole conversation? Well, we can look at the the assistance of AI in multiple formats. Look at assisted writing. So assisted writing is not a new concept. The Bible was written by a pseudopictographer. There was somebody who wrote under a pseudonym, pseudonym that interviewed basically one of the, the uh, apostles and took their stories and wrote it for them. So there were, there were people that wrote under pseudonyms, ghostwriters that wrote that. Um, we have ghostwriters, books are written with ghostwriters. There's assisted editors. There's assisted writing has been around forever. Now it's just artificially happening. And so now you can get an assisted writing and ask them a stupid question and you're going to get a stupid output. But if you know what a pseudopictographer is, then you can ask AI, tell me how pseudopictographers wrote and helped with the Bible. Well, if you didn't know what that was, you couldn't ask the question, so you couldn't get something intelligent out. Just like Google. And I had somebody who said, well, you're cheating with AI. I said, well, hold on, how'd you get here? And they go, I drove. I said, well, you're not meant to drive. Why don't you just walk? You cheater. Why would you use a machine to get you here faster and more efficiently? You should have walked. And that's what AI is. It's just another evolution of who we are. Is there an abuse of it? Are there people that are too lazy and never walk? Yep. And they're paying the price. They're paying the price. And so now, can you have a car and still work out? Yes. Can you have AI and still read and get smart? Of course. In fact, I'd, I'd venture to say that AI is making you smarter in some ways. Because I can go, man, tell me about this. I'm looking for a study that there was a study and it, it talked about this and this percentage of that. What was that? Oh, here's the study. I'm like, ah, and I read and consume that study and I become smarter. And I may say, but how does that apply to this? And it's a conversation with a teacher. But if I ask good questions, I get great output. And I get, and I and have this great, wonderful conversation. And I was doing this, I'm doing this, uh, this test. And I'm like, and I literally, I said, okay, I'm going to write a book today. And I said, and I talk, talked and I opened up uh, Word and I said, we're going to write a book on this fairy tale, the fairy tale my mother wrote before she passed. And I want to turn it into something. And so I want to write a fairy tale about uh, a business that was facing market pressure, industry that was going under, and how everybody spent all their time and energy looking for um, a solution outside. So they brought in consultants, they brought in outside people and mentors. And they went on this journey of ups and downs, and, and they finally found somebody who became a mentor, but only asked tough questions. And then the, the, they went back and they implemented, they failed, there was massive resistance, and they came back finally to find the solution was that they, there was no cavalry coming to save them because the cavalry was already there. It was them. And I, I just dictated that into Word. And I, I said, Chad GPT, I want, write me a table of contents about a book, 50,000 words about this story, and I pasted it in there. Three seconds later, boom, and I looked at it. I'm like, okay, I agreed with this. Don't this. I said, now I wanna make sure I follow the hero's journey process. And I wanted to, then I started giving. Now, who knows the hero's journey? If you don't know that, you wouldn't know to ask that. And so then we were writing three or four chapters, and I said, well, I said, I go, we got too quickly into the solution. I'd like to make this a little bit more suspenseful. And went through, we've got, I've got 13 chapters written in three hours. Hmm. Now I got to go back and I'm like, do I like it? You know, my book I wrote myself before Chappie GPT came around, but man, my book would have been better if I had it. I would have asked it much more questions. You would have still more time myself. to think through it as well. Yeah. And I would have said, you know, I've got, I'm, I'm messing this little section. I need something, a really good story or an example to drive home the point of how interpersonal communication drives 
increase revenue in an organization? And how does communication drive revenue? Give me a study. And I would have gotten that study like this. And I would have said, ah, give me an application of that. What does that look like? Give me three industries. How does it apply to real estate, mortgage, and financial advisors? Perfect. Here's three examples. Can you give me a script to each one of those? Okay, perfect. Boom, bam, bam, bam. Now I'm thinking from a consultative standpoint. I'm thinking from the reader perspective. That's my skill set. That's not, that's not AI skill set. It's mine. But I'm using AI to do that. Good answer. So let's uh, continue down the path of the content creation. Now we've, 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 uh, I think we're eliminating objections here as we go along. And we kind of touched on what do I say a little bit at, when I asked you the question about, you know, what, how, how you know, how, how can they do it in their world versus your world? And, you know, you talked about, you know, talk to your kids or, you know, just stop what you're doing, you know, go to the, you know, when you're at the grocery store, which I wholeheartedly agree with. So I think we started down the path of what do I say? Uh, so now let me, let me set the table again. So we've talked about use your camera, use your phone, right? That's your camera. And uh, you just start practicing, start talking. You've got the options for Fiverr. You've got the option for ChatGPT. In fact, in reality, uh, oftentimes you can just come up with the concepts in your head, go ask ChatGPT for a script, and it's at least going to set a baseline for you. Even if you don't like 100%. it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get you off the ground. So you have no excuses there, right? Now, the next step I think is, okay, what do I say? And more importantly than what <laughs> do I say is, what do I say that I can now do it in perpetuity for the next three years and yeah. do it consistently. So what we're looking for is this concept called my ethos. What's your ethos? Uh, Aristotle was the first person to talk about argumentative thought 2000 years ago. And he said he created what is called his rhetorical triangle it means to be, to win an argument, to create a, a case for something to be persuasive. You have to have, appeal to three things. One is your ethos. You have to be credible. And you, you, what's your character? Your character has to fit the topic. You have to be credible within the topic. You wouldn't listen to somebody who's overweight on how to lose weight. You wouldn't listen to somebody who's broke on how to make money. You wouldn't listen to me on how to grow rich and thick hair or any insights on the menstrual cycle. I don't have any hair and I've never had a menstrual cycle. So I'm not a good credi credible person in those two pieces. I lack ethos. And so knowing that it's another way of saying, what's my lane of my credibility? And so the other two are pathos, which is the emotional appeal, which drives action and behavior and logic, logos, which would be the logical appeal. It's got to make sense. And so focusing on ethos is the first place of really understanding your personal brand. What is the ethos of who you are, the essence of who you are? And that sounds hard to grab. And so I want to make it really easy. So if I were to ask you uh, the question, Jeff, who are you? What do you do? What makes you unique? What would you say? As it relates to what, personal or business? You pick. Uh, as it relates to business, uh, being in the mortgage business, I would say what makes me different is uh, understanding how to bring value to my target audience that's different okay. from the rest of the industry. So would you say understanding, would that be empathy? Um, I don't know if empathy is the right word. Maybe it is. Uh, maybe I should right. articulate, maybe I should take this a little further. Take it, go for it. Yeah. You know, so I think that understanding how to, how to, I, I think our industry looks at value as I answer my phone, I'm communicative, I meet get deadlines, you know, that sort of thing. I have the right programs. I have the right rate. That's your job. In my opinion, what value is to our target audience, which is a real estate agent is how can I support their business? And I'm not talking about credit cards. I'm talking about how can I actually help you grow your business? So the way I look at it is how can I become more valuable than their broker? When I can do that, now they need me in their life. They don't just want me in their life. And when I don't answer my phone on a Sunday, they're going to be more, uh, you know, they're going to be more apt to be patient with me than they are with the typical person who has the traditional value, which is, okay, now I'm just going to call the next person down the street. So unique value. Unique value. So but, but to understand that, you have to understand people and what's valuable to them, not what's valuable to you. Correct. Right? And I think that's, that's what differentiates it. I think we think of it from a selfish perspective. I think it's self-serving rather than serving others oftentimes when we talk yeah. about our value. Love that. And so you love to serve people. Yes. 
So one, creating unique value. The other one is serve. The, the dotted line between the unique value and empathy is it takes empathy to understand what what the shoes that the other person is walking in, the challenges that they're facing for you to be able to solve that. So that to me would be the highest sophistication expression of empathy is what you just said. So, all right. So now give me three words, three more words that, that you say describe you or that make you unique. Three more words. Uh, okay. Uh, I would go with, um, like caring, hard work, simple words. Okay. Uh, well, and innovative, innovative. Okay. Um, gosh, uh, you know, is, is uh, discipline. Okay. Discipline. And one more, uh, hardworking and hardworking. Perfect. If you're listening to this, by the way, you should do the same thing because you'll like what's next. So now would you say that, um, Empathy, unique value, service, innovation, discipline, and hard work are closely related to your personal values. I would say yes. I would say so too. So now if you notice, we just quickly uncovered your personal value system, your personal value system through the question of what makes you unique. And the reason why that works is because we try to live out our values in the things that we're most proud of who we are, how we want to be known are the things that reflect our personal values. And do you hear the difference? How we want to be known? What's another thing that reflects that? Your personal brand, how you want to be known. So your personal brand should reflect your personal values. And when you uncover that, that is your ethos. Your ethos, you want people to expect value, unique value of service, innovative, disciplined, and hardworking. When you walk in the room, you want people to think that. So now that's the, that is the ethos of your brand. And when you know the questions to ask, you can get to it right away. But now, could you write an article on innovation? Uh, Did you talk about the importance of innovation? I think so as it relates to video and social, yeah. Yeah, you can do it all day long. Yeah. How about discipline? Could you talk about the importance of discipline? 100%. Hard work? Yes. Being of service to people? Yes. Concept of unique value? Mm -hmm. Being empathetic and listening to people? I now realize yes. Right? So that is called effortless for you. It's not hard for you to do that. So now I would build your social media strategy around those six points. Those six points take two months for each one of them. One month on value, or, or excuse me, on empathy, one month on unique value, or uh, two months on value, two months on unique value, or on empathy, unique value, two months on service, two months on innovation, two months on discipline, and two months of hard work. Spread them out. Now, in each month, you've got four weeks. You can write a blog, blog post, one per week. You can write four articles on hard work, eight throughout the year. Simple. Go to Chad GBT and say, here's what I want to talk about hard work. I want to talk about working when you don't want to. What does it mean to push yourself deeper and talk to it for a little bit and have it structured into, you know, eight, 10, 12 paragraph blog posts it ends up on LinkedIn. Now, the beautiful thing about that blog post, that becomes content for a video. And now, all of a sudden you say, hey, Chad GBT, can you, can you write me a hook for this, this article? Write me, write me five hooks for this uh, hard work and a short script that defines a problem when it comes to hard work and then offers a solution. So now I write hook problem solution. And there's my script for viral video. That's how we grew it. I didn't use ChatGPT, by the way. I have a secret weapon person that does it. But now you can. And so now all of a sudden, what to talk about? Your ethos. Because it's what you naturally talk about and believe already. The, the challenge that I have on going to, you know, the what's trending is that sometimes what's trending has nothing to do with you. Yeah. And there's a lot of trending things that I'm like, I have zero passion for. But sometimes what's trending, I have zero credibility in. And so maybe I need to be the one to create the trend. And it might be trending, but might be trending for the wrong people. But if I put out loudly enough to the world what it is that I believe, then maybe the ones that believe that too will resonate with it. And it might not be a million followers, but it might be a thousand really good ones. Yeah. You ever seen a room full of a thousand people? Exactly. A room full of a thousand people is a lot. I speak a lot and I've never spoke to a thousand. Well, when you think of a thousand followers, that's a lot. Yes. But we don't people, think of it that way. We don't think we of don't. it. We don't. Yeah. We're desensitized. A thousand followers who believe what you believe and love what you talk about. 
is way more powerful than a hundred thousand people that don't even know who you are. Yeah. And that's the reason I started my social media over, by the way, five months ago. I said, you know what? I don't think we have an engaged audience. I don't think we have, you know, I, I think I had 26,000 followers, but we couldn't get our videos to launch. And I said, you know what? Let's just start this over. Start over. I had another group ran my social media like five years ago, and they did, they put us part of a campaign. Probably screwed you yes. Oh, totally. Yeah. And they said, oh, we're, we're going to get you the swipe up feature so you can get 10,000 followers. And I'm like, oh, okay, go, cool, whatever. I don't, I could care less about it. This was five years ago. I don't, psh, whatever. And now I got serious about it. I'm like, why isn't it growing? I'm like, probably because a good 50% of these people, may not even be real. Yeah. And that took an honest approach to, for me to be honest and, and let check my ego to go, I'm starting over. And this was five months ago, starting over. They looked at me like, I'm crazy. You can lose 26,000 followers. I'm like, yep, they're gone. And sorry, my face got blurred. There you go. That's good. And they're gone. And I said, but we're going to be able to at least tell a story that's, that's true if this grows or I'm full of shit and it's not going to work. Either way, the truth will come out. Yeah. And lo and behold, 115,000 followers. Who would have thought that being more honest would have worked? It's pretty, pretty incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Now, I, now, now I want to ask you this uh, as it relates to what we just did, the exercise that we just did. So A, I think it's a little bit easier for me because I'm far deeper down this path than, again, the average consumer. So for somebody who's sitting there listening to this and it's kind of a light bulb, like, oh, wow, that was really cool. I need to do the same thing. I need my own ethos. I need those six things. I love the strategy. It can, you know, and that can start to multiply and it, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start rolling downhill. But they don't have you. I'm here talking to you. You're challenging me. I have maybe a little bit of an advantage because it words can come a little bit quicker to me because I'm partially in your world. So how does, so how do you help someone listening to this create their own ethos? Well, one is get, get the six to 10 or five or whatever words down first, get those down first. So then the next phase of this is how do you talk about it? And so of those six, I want, and we're going to go to the next phase of this, which of these speaks to your heart the most? Empathy, unique value, service, innovation, discipline, or hard work? To me? Yeah. You're going to make me choose. I'm going to, I'm going to go with innovation. Innovative. Innovation. Yeah. Okay. And so you got innovation. Okay. So now ask yourself. So ask yourself. This is, if these are reflective of your personal values, right? These are reflective of your personal values. And what we know about science is that those personal values are formulated between the ages of nine and 13, right? Page, ages nine to 13. So now the question is, you didn't just like last week decide to become innovative. No. This is something that like innovation has been a passion of yours for a long time. And so the question is, okay, if those, those were formulated between the ages of nine and 13, who was around and what happened? And so here's the question. Who was around between ages nine to 13 and that will trigger either one of two types of stories, either what we call a lighthouse story, either a lighthouse story or a foghorn story. Does that make sense? So either Explain. a lighthouse story or a foghorn story. Explain. And so, okay. So what it's going to create is either a lighthouse story or a foghorn story. Here's what I mean by that. So there was either somebody in your life that when it came to the concept of innovation or thinking creatively was a lighthouse. They were a beacon of hope. There was somebody that just showed you the way and you looked at them and you're like, man, I want to be like them. Or you had the opposite. You had a foghorn, somebody that wasn't innovative, somebody that couldn't think creatively, just was stuck in the old ways, would not grow with the times, would not, would just be stuck in just, uh, you know, it's the way it's always been done. And you saw the pain of that and you said, man, I don't ever want to be like that. And they became the warning sign of which you didn't want to be. And so you spent the rest of your life because you were in darkness, the foghorn, you spent the rest of your life becoming the light. And so when you say innovative, nine to 13, who comes to mind? Were they a lighthouse or a foghorn? I don't know that, uh, I don't know that the innovative word goes back to that time in my life, to be honest with you. 
Well, so th think about new ideas. Um, think about fresh. Think about thinking differently. Think about having fun and creative. Um, something created and innovation also to me comes with curiosity. Like one, what makes you such a good interviewer, by the way, you're doing, you're an excellent interviewer is your curiosity, right? You're seeking the truth. What, who sparked that curiosity in you? Yeah. I, I, if, if you asked me, if you asked me that without telling me the nine to 13, I would have said it was the dawn of social that, that really created the curiosity and yeah, but you had a sense of curiosity it. prior to that. That's what just, that was just a new manifestation uh, of curiosity. I guess so. And I've never thought right? of it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is good. This is, by the way, what you're going through is the process we have to go through, right? We have to, we're going back a little bit further, back a little bit further. So go back, just even push back a little bit further. Where did this curiosity come from? Where did your continual desire to learn? Because maybe learning is another one. You want to constantly learn, which a curious person is somebody who's always curious to learn more. They love learning. Curiosity yeah. is the act of getting more information. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I was always curious by by people that were doing things better than I was. I, I and again, I think more recent times. So I think professionally, I've always been enamored. Try, by try to go back though. This is where it gets fun. I'm gonna then challenge I, you. Then I would guess. Then I would guess that it probably because I was an athletic kid, always playing sports, never was the best on my teams. Mm -hmm. Was always probably in the you know was 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 in the top five. I was probably the th the third through fifth best player on my teams, but I was always wanting to be better. And so I guess I probably was just consumed with with the people that were better than me. And and you know how do I get there? And can I spend more time with them? And can I become their friends? And those sort of things. I I I would think. Yeah. So let's go back to that. Do you remember a time when you did that? You know, I just, I feel like that was my entire childhood with sports in general. I mean, I'm thinking about my baseball, thinking about baseball, you know? So here's the value of storytelling. This is where the, the science of insulin comes, come, comes in. When you say it was an entire childhood, there's no story there. What I want you to say, well, just choose any story. I remember this one time, you know, Johnny Smith, man, his kid was so good. And I remember like, think of one example of somebody you wanted to emulate and be like and learn from. Yeah. I, I don't, uh, off the top of my head, I, I'd have to think long and hard about that, to be gonna, honest with No, you. you don't. Actually, I'm going to challenge you because this, this is the okay. work. What you're feeling right. is exactly what our listeners are feeling right now. Yeah, and so right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to push you into a corner and you're going to pick anything. And you're going to realize that it doesn't matter which you pick. Pick anything. Was it a coach? Or was it a player? Was it a teammate? Was it an opponent? Was it a, a, a professional athlete that you watch, your favorite athlete on TV? Sure. Pick one. I, I, well, now that you mention it, you know, I did have a, uh, you know, we, I grew up in a time I'm 45. I grew up in a time when, you know, it was you, your coaches could actually be really hard on you. And the parents didn't say anything about it. Not like today yep. where, you know, and uh, I, I can, I can vividly remember like our baseball coach. And this was my coach from like T-ball all the way into high school. We were a very good competitive team. And I remember that if you made a mistake in the field, you started crying before you even got off the field because you knew that ass rimming was about ready to come. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and so tell me what, and so tell us a story about that. I remember. I mean, that's, time. that's, I mean, so you, you know, I think I, I you know, as you, but here's, think here's what I want to challenge you, right? Here's, here's what it works. Okay. I remember this one time. Try that. Okay, sure. Uh, well, I, I remember there was many times because I wasn't perfect. I was a center fielder, and and I remember a, a time when, you know, charging on a on a single, somebody was on second base, and you know, of course, as a center fielder, one of the the greatest uh, the greatest feats of any game is to peg somebody at home plate, mm. and so you you're thinking more about the the transition from glove to hand to just throwing a dart to home plate and sometimes you know if if the ball took a funny skip or you didn't get your glove all the way down to the ground it, it stayed down and went underneath your glove and then <laughs> disaster and uh yeah that that happened more than once and so you either missed it or you got it right yeah both yeah so now so now here's how i would turn that into a story into a value proposition right so somebody asks you about what you do. Let's say somebody asks you about the importance of AI. And you might say, you know, I remember as a kid, uh, sports was everything to me. And I was a center fielder. 
And man, I remember I, I grew up in an era where the coaches, they weren't supposed to be nice. They didn't have to be nice and they could yell at you and the parents would never know about it. Nor would the parents get involved. It was just a different era. Yeah. And I remember we had a coach that if, if you messed up in the outfield, you were already crying in the outfield because you knew what awaited you. And what's fascinating is that what it did for me is it made me focus and get hyper tuned in on the fundamentals on whether it was, you know, you know, one of the greatest feats is to be able to, if you're a center fielder, can you, can you throw somebody out at home base? That means that you've got to have all your mechanics down perfectly, but in the midst of execution, you have to sometimes innovate. You have to take something that is fundamental and maybe there's a rock, there's a dip, there's a divot, there's something's there and you got to be able to innovate on the spot while maintaining all the mechanics to be able to make that throw perfectly to home base. And we find ourselves now in a time where it's the same. Yeah, we have AI. That's, but the fundamentals of business haven't changed. We just have to be able to innovate. We're still talking to customers. We're still making phone calls. We're still writing scripts and doing videos. But now can we make those minor adjustments and utilize AI to innovate and to maybe make that wonderful play like we're playing it at home or maybe make that perfect video or that perfect story at the right time, mm -hmm. but utilize uh, AI as a form of innovation. You see how we just tied all those together? Yeah. So that's what, that's the Amplify formula, by the way, that we teach. But it begins with understanding your ethos. And then what's the story that really drove that, the origin story of that? And leveraging that into what does it mean today? And how do I connect those dots into creating that story? And all of a sudden now you can tie that to almost anything. Also becomes content. And it's all content. I love that. I now love imagine that. taking the origin of each one of your words and coming up with 10 different stories of places and examples that, that empathy and unique value and service and discipline and hard work. I bet you you got a story about hard work. There was somebody, a lighthouse or a foghorn about light, about hard work. There was somebody who was a lighthouse or a foghorn about discipline. Somebody who was a lighthouse or a foghorn around service and value and empathy. And if you identify those places, but this requires work and reflection, by the way. So I tell the listeners, you got to go through this is if you consider yourself a professional, professional approaches everything at game speed. They're working hard. And this is the kind of work that we can do as, as professionals to get better at connecting with people, telling stories. And if, if you want to be able to, to help somebody, if you're, I mean, you're in real estate, you got to be able to convince people that right now is a great time to buy. Because I believe it is. This is an amazing time to buy. I would much rather buy now. In fact, we are again. Now, than when interest rates were so low because everything was so inflated, I'd rather pay a little bit higher interest rate right now to a, for a fair market price on a house. Interest rates will equalize; they're going to come down again. But the value that I buy now is locked in. I want to buy now. So, but you, but can you tell the story? Are you credible? Can you articulate the the markets and what's going on? Can you truly answer the question of why now is the time to buy? And can, can you do it in a believable way? Are you actually buying right now? You can't tell people to buy without buying yourself. So there's all sorts of things that are happening there that, that, that all play into becoming more influential in telling that story. How would, of you, course, how would you use this? I, and I, and I, th I think that, that some of our listeners might be thinking right now, okay, I get it. You know, if I'm standing on a stage, which I'm never going to be, uh, there's that story, com the, the component. Maybe, maybe I can use this in my content because that is a great hook. Anytime you get a studio, you, know, you can start with a story. They're going to be more inclined to listen. But as it relates to, you know, Susie homeowner, where I have the listing presentation or attracting more buyers, how does this relate? How, how do I, how am I going to use this, this, what you just talked about? Life is a stage. Sometimes it's just you sitting across a, di a dining room table, across a Zoom meeting with one-on-one. -on -one. That's a stage moment. That's a moment where you're presenting an idea, where you're needing to connect. You're needing to be able to articulate something that may be misunderstood. You needed to cut through and the irrational fears that the media is creating. It's no different whether you're on a stage. In fact, I tell people, I said, most of the influence you're having in life, even for me, I do the, like if you said, 237 days, the majority of my life isn't on a stage. It's usually in small interpersonal groups. Yes, do I get big, huge stages? Yeah, but not most of the time. The best speakers done. I, I'm, I'm probably one of the busier speakers out there. It's still most of the time is interpersonal. And so all of these things apply absolutely interpersonally. Should you strive for one to many? You need to. That's where your business starts growing. Social media is an option for that. The stage is an option for that. Podcasting is an option for that. I mean, all of this stuff is you take one message to many people. 
Let's talk a little bit about influence because obviously it's a it's a it's a word that you use all the time. It's it's a big part of your platforms. When you think about the word influence in today's world, you know, and I've had this argument with my oldest kids. I have a 23 and a 19 year old, and they're a big inspiration about where I am on social. But in the beginning, and I, by the beginning, I mean five, six years ago, they used to tell me I didn't know what I was doing on social because to them, influence means to be an influencer, to be a Kardashian, yeah. to be broad based. Yeah. And and what what I've helped them understand is that niche influence is arguably more important. But how how do you how do you articulate the value of influence? Because I still believe that most people, when they hear that word, and and that's been thrown around loosely at me in my market. Oh, Jeff, you're an influencer, like. What does yeah. that even mean? Well, so <clears throat> I'm glad you brought that up because there's a di everybody ha can have influence. An influencer is anybody in a leadership position that has an audience. Is that an audience? And so now there's the mega influencers. So those are anomalies. Right? Like they they do what they do, and you can't copy their strategies because it just doesn't work. And their their strategies work in mega influence arenas but for us normal people right and even like okay i've got the following i have that's still that's still i'm still normal i'm still not known i'd argue that well maybe, maybe not mega that. but there's something in between normal and mega that that's probably I, but yes and it's starting to cross over but i have to create content as if i'm not known because most of my audience does not know me Fair. in the beginning it's constantly putting it out this broad net to people that don't know me. And the mistake that I made was I was assuming that I was talking to people who knew me and they don't. And that's where that microsecond, three second into what we call the, the audition, you're auditioning for attention and it's a three second audition. And so if you think about it, okay, I'm auditioning for attention to people that don't know me, don't care about me and have zero idea of whether I've written a book or whether I'm a speaker or if I'm any good. That's humbling. Okay, <laughs> breathe. So what could I say that can actually capture attention? That's what we're talking about. And so if you think about it, it's, a, it's an even playing field every time something's posted. We all have the same opportunity. We're being shown to people that don't know us. Now, your account starts to grow, starts to gain some algorithm, does like you, it'll show to a few more people. But my first account, my first videos were... 300, 200, when I restarted, then 500, no, oh, then 700. Oh, man, this got 1,500, 300, you know, it's like, and then all of a sudden, uh, it 10,000. Oh, okay, hold on a second. And then 15,000, one of them hit 5 million. I got one on TikTok or TikTok to 25, I probably have like 10 videos that are in the multi millions. And it's like, okay, what happened? But now, even TikTok's in a low. I can't get past 1,100, 1,200 views on TikTok for the last month. So there's an algorithm thing, right? And so it, I, I don't understand it, I'm trying to figure it out. But I also know I'm just still going to still keep creating it. Yeah. It doesn't matter. And so there's multiple uses of it, whether that audience sees it or not. But a lot, what who end up seeing it are people that go and search me out. Well, what is Renee doing? Oh, he has a following. Okay. So there's a vanity metric. And so, okay, who's following? Okay, well, there's that. All right, well, oh, these are cool videos. And they don't care. They don't care about the views. At that point, is the video valuable? I used to have to, as a speaker, you have to have a, a speaker reel. That was the most important thing. Was so here's my speaker reel as a, as a speaker, and <clears throat> now my speaker reel is my social media. If you go there, there's video after video after video after video of me speaking, and if that works, okay, let's have them on stage. They don't even look at the reel anymore. I mean, that talk about something that just blew my mind. Yeah. I mean, we spent so much money on these reels. It's like now, a resume. I do, yeah, exactly. It, it totally is. Mm -hmm. It's a collection of my ethos of what I believe, things that I'm credible in. Now, YouTube becomes the extension of all of that short form. YouTube is when like, oh, I like you. Where can I get more? And then you open up and you dive in and then there's YouTube where you can watch 10, 12, 15 minute, 30 minute videos. And now all of a sudden it's longer. But to your point, you said in the beginning, I'm seeking you out. I'm hitting play on a podcast. Well, still those videos, all right, well, I'm going to give you a little bit longer, but if it's boring in the beginning and I'm doing all of the, the, the stuff in the beginning, you got to hook me. 
still got to hook me in a different way. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, we've uh, gone way past my typical time on a podcast episode. So I want to, I want to get close to wrapping up because I, I very much value your time and I really appreciate the time you've given us. First of all, uh, you know, I think again, I I think our audience is is fairly familiar with you, uh, but but for those that aren't, where is the best place to go connect and find you and learn more? Probably my Instagram is the easiest. It's Learn with Renee R E N E one E, Learn L E A R N with Renee, and in there, the link in the bio is to my uh, link tree. I think it's my link tree, or it might be my website. You go to my website, meet Renee, M E E T, not M E A T, M E E T, Renee, R E N E dot com. And you'll see all of our events. You'll see our Amplify. We do a monthly coaching group, our podcast. All of it's easily accessible there. YouTube channel, you name it. We're, um, well, I got one of my favorite compliments I got yesterday was Renee, I wanted to learn more about this thing that I, I talked about. And I searched you up and I saw you do a whole video and it was free. And you taught me exactly how to do it. Went to my presentation and I killed it. And you didn't charge me anything. I was like, awesome. And he's like, you, I can't believe you're giving this stuff away for free. I'm like, I know it's, it's the craziest thing, but it's also, man, it's stress-free just to say, let's put all the best stuff out there and give it one. It feels good values wise because you get to help people, but two, it also creates great conversation where people come back and they, I get to have diff different and bigger conversations. How do I do this? Can I go deeper with you? Yeah, let's do it. And they're coming more prepped to learn, more leverage, so they they go further down the process. And so, if you just dig, it's all out there. And it's, I mean, I try to make it as accessible as possible. I think you do. Um, I, I was just stalking as we were talking. So, the what would be the best parting words? I, I think this is a great example of a podcast where I think you're gonna you're think you're gonna find a lot of people seeking more because we just scratched the surface on so much, uh, you know, so what would be the best, uh, what, what would be your best summary that you're going to leave our audience with? That I understand the struggle that you're in right now. I understand the ups and downs of a market a fear. And you made a decision to believe in something, home ownership. And you were asked to do that in a way that didn't pay you a salary. You said, I'm going to believe in this thing and I don't want a salary. I'll eat when I kill something. That is a pretty noble thing to do. You're a sales professional. With that comes the challenges of rejection, comes the challenges of the media, comes the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows, the doubt, the self-doubt, because there's nothing like a commission job to make you look in the mirror and say, man, am I any good? And that search and the facing of the truth of who we are is hard. That's why we gravitate to things like podcasts and, you know, motivational speeches and, and events, because we need to have coping methods to deal with this reality that we face. But I promise you this, you're in the right industry. Hard work will pay off. Finding ways to add value and listening, and being empathetic, using your emotional intelligence will pay off continuing to learn and grow, being parts of groups like this, like learn, lab coat and surrounding yourself like with people like Jeff and Tristan. And that's the kind of stuff that makes you grow. You become more like who you're around. Mm -hmm. Check your group, check your friends. Are they moving you closer to further from? If you're part of the ho-hum, this sucks. It's a horrible place. Get out of that room immediately. Protect what goes in your ears. Protect it because this is part of a cycle. Yes, we might be on the lower part right now. I don't even think we are. And you know, quite frankly, it doesn't matter. Yes, is it harder to sell things? Yeah. So what? When did hard matter? Hard only equates to more value. If you can do it, you will find more value right now. And when things turn around, like the cycle is in a circle, we're going to come back. It's going to be easy times pretty soon. This is how it works. Yeah. And if you work hard during these times, the easy times become incredibly beautiful. So. If you weren't ready for these hard times, wonderful. You get to tell the story in a few years. I remember when. And if you fought through it and you won, you get to tell even that story. So I'll tell you this. I heard Joe Rogan say this once and I loved it. Pretend that you are the star in your own movie. And this movie was the best comeback in history. What did the star do? How did they behave? How did they act? What did they say? And let that guide you.
but you're doing a good thing. Keep pushing. And I hope this was valuable. Fantastic, man. Really appreciate you being on today. Uh, if you're not already following, go check him out. It's learn with Renee, R E N E on Instagram. He's got his links there. So you can go down a massive rabbit hole. If Instagram doesn't grab you enough, Renee, it's been a pleasure. It's great to finally uh, meet formally. Likewise. And I uh, hope, hope we get to do more of this. Appreciate it. Anytime, my friend. Thank you so much. The honor was mine. Agents Podcasts.